Welcome back, folks. This is Joint Justice Oversight on uh, Wednesday, October 16th. We're going to shift gears quickly here. Um, we've been trying to have a conversation with uh, Ashley Berlin, Berliner, who's Director of Medicaid Policy for DIVA, the Department of Vermont Health Access. We've been trying to have this conversation for a couple of our <laughs> previous meetings and haven't been able to. But if folks remember, we filed, the state and DOC filed for a waiver with CMS uh, called the 1115 waiver, which would help DOC, help us tremendously, and help folks who are incarcerated that 90 days prior to their release date, they would be able to qualify for Medicaid. And that would be a tremendous help uh, for folks as they're transitioning into the community in terms of being able to provide medical services as well as prescription medication that they need, as well as hooking up with, with their primary provider or even establishing a relationship with a primary provider, as well as any uh, services, medical services or um, behavioral health services or substance use services that they would need. But a key piece to this is working with DIVA in terms of setting up the system for um, Medicaid to be applied. So this is where Ashley comes into play. And Ashley, thank you so much for your flexibility over the last couple of meetings that we've had. Um, and if you could bring us uh, up to speed in terms of what would be needed on DIVA's end, what would be needed if you can maybe on DOC season, if there's anything in terms of how we can implement our 1115 waiver and also the timeline and if there's any financial costs to this. So welcome and if you could just identify yourself for the record. Thank you. I'm Ashley Berliner. I'm the director of Medicaid policy for the Agency of Human Services. Are you able to hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I do have a slide deck. I don't know. I, I had sent it to Megan months ago at this point when I was originally scheduled. Um, I don't know if that's something that you want me to share today or not. I'm happy to just kind of yes. have a conversation yeah. about it as well. Yeah. Why don't you share it with us? Can you do it from your end or should mm -hmm. Megan do it? Um, I should be able to do it. Yeah. Give me one second here. We have this posted on our <laughs> I might not be able to do it in the best way. I can't quite figure out how to put it in presentation mode. So you won't be quite as clean as I'd like, but Let's see how this works. Okay. That looks fine, Ashley. Okay, and now I have lost you. So let me figure out how to find you again. I never am on Zoom. You'd think 2024, I would know how to do this, but we're always on teams at it's different. It is different. Okay. But here we are. I think I figured it out here. Um, so yes, I was here back last session to talk about how we were putting this waiver to use. Um, we got this waiver, we applied for this waiver in 2022. Um, let me go back here. I'm sorry, one second. I'm just struggling with my view. Okay. We got this waiver, or we applied for this waiver in 2022. We didn't actually get it until July of this year, approved July 1st of this year. So when I had spoken to you last session, we were still in the middle of negotiating and it has now been approved. We are one of a handful of states that now have this flexibility. 
And we've been working really diligently with the Department of Corrections as a partnership with the Medicaid program, really for the first time, to stand this up. Our planned implementation date is January 1st, 2026. And we're doing a lot of planning right now to make sure that we can hit that. Um, essentially, we needed a very long runway because it is significant programmatic change in the facilities. It is a change to how we bill for a certain set of services. We have to make eligibility system changes, claim system changes, talk to providers, change protocols, ensure access for the inmates to um, certain technology. So as you can imagine, it's a really, really big undertaking that requires quite a bit of a runway. Some of my slides I think are very preliminary for you. Um, I'll skip over this very quickly because you know this better than I do. Um, but we are rolling out this reentry services benefit across all six in state facilities in, in Vermont. Um, and we are looking at post adjudicated individuals only for people receiving reentry services. And I'll just take a step back, I apologize. Um, the waiver, what it does for the state of Vermont is it allows us to get federal funding for services provided within the walls of a correctional facility for the first time ever. Um, this is a really big deal. We're really excited that we're able to bring this federal funding into our facility and focus on reentry services for the pre-release population. The waiver explicitly allows 90 days of Medicaid payment for service, 90 days pre-release to receive Medicaid payment for services. And those services are outlined here as case management, medication assisted treatment, a 30 day supply of all prescription medication at release, medication and administration um, throughout those that 90 day pre-release, screening for common health mm -hmm. conditions and peer support services. It also provides um, for Vermont chronic care initiative to come in and really hold that case management role at the pre-release period and then into post-release. When we're talking about our six facilities and the post-adjudicated population, um, we're really looking at the um, number of individuals who are sentenced in DOC facilities. We have um, 861 sentenced at, at this point in time mm -hmm. and individuals released for a uh, six month period, seven month period is 700 and, or sorry, 572. So we're really looking at, you know, roughly a thousand people a year that would be eligible for these post-release services. Can you go back to that slide? I, I want to get a better understanding of the 500. <clears throat> so between, as I was, uh, my attention went elsewhere for a minute. So between January and July of this year, for the last part of FY24, we had 572 folks who were sentenced. And as of the end of August, we now have 861. Correct? So this is individuals in a facility at a given yeah. time, and this is individuals released. I, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's individuals released. So that's, okay. we're specifically looking at the released population when we are um, talking about this waiver and reentry services. Individuals who are not set to be released are just getting business as usual services being provided. So is it fair to say that in a fiscal year, we could have <clears throat> had a thousand people released as a ballpark? A thousand people yeah. have been sentenced. sentenced. So, and I know released. I said in the room, yeah. uh, but this is individuals who we have many, many more than that who are detained, but these are individuals right. who 
who've actually been convicted of a crime and are serving the sentence who then go on to be released back into the community. And the Medicaid waiver would not apply to folks who are detained, <clears throat> is that correct? Correct, at this time. Um, right. the, the waiver could apply and for a future date, we have the option as a state to apply it to the pre-adjudicated population as well. We are certainly very interested in exploring that as kind of a phase two after we have our sea legs under us and can really make sure that we are able to serve the post-adjudicated population the way that we want and that our systems are functioning. We decided we were going to take a little bit of a smaller bite of the apple, this first step. Um, all goes well. Everything's working smoothly. We feel like we have the capacity at the state level. We'll absolutely be considering the pre-adjudicated population as well. Um, as you know, the pre-adjudicated population, those individuals who haven't yet been convicted, convicted are a little harder to pin down in terms of when they'll be released. So the idea of giving them pre-release services when they could be released tomorrow or nine months from now, it's, it was just a really a much harder calculus than looking at only those individuals who have been sentenced. And we have more of a concept of how long they'll be serving and when we can start targeting those pre-release services. So Ashley, we do have a question. Teresa? Thank you. Um, thank you, Ashley. This is uh, Teresa Wood. Um, so my question is actually about the, the detainee um, folks. Do you have any data on how many of those folks have Medicaid prior to being detained? I might need to call a friend here. Uh, Isaac, do you have a sense Very of that? Uh, I, I would have, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. The department doesn't ask that information at any mm -hmm. time their coverage status is. I mean, I would imagine- You can look it up. <laughs> you can look it up, but that's you know, not, not what our staff are doing uh, upon looking, but uh, it's possible. So the, the reason that I asked the question is, so I get what you're saying, Ashley, about, you know, it's a, there are a lot more variables to look at, but I guess there's also the concept of if you already have Medicaid, mm -hmm. then, you know, you could keep Medicaid during your deta detainee status, um, as opposed to you actually having to do anything to determine, you know, when they're going to be discharged. Do you understand what I'm saying? Totally. And it's actually a perfect segue going into this next slide. So let me just turn to the next slide and then we can talk about it. One of the requirements of not just this waiver, but of the Medicaid program at large is that we suspend rather than terminate individuals once they come into a correctional facility. So there is something um, in federal law that is called an inmate exclusion. It prohibits Medicaid dollars from being spent on an inmate when they are within the facility. This waiver is providing us this 90 day carve out of the inmate exclusion, but they're saying even though they're excluded and you can't bill down, we don't want you to terminate their enrollment. We want you to just suspend them. And what we are doing as part of this process is making sure that we actually have the function functionality to suspend them. And then make sure if they're not already enrolled, enroll them um, and make sure when they are leaving the facility, whether they're sentenced or just detained, pre-adjudicated, that people are going back into the community with Medicaid eligibility. So that's a, a big focus of this, regardless of the population, is making sure people have access to the Medicaid application, getting them on Medicaid if they're not already. We're looking at that holistically, not just on the sentenced side of the population. Of course, that's already supposed to be happening. <laughs> that's not something new. Um, it is, and we don't have the functionality today. So we're we're really using this as a, a big motivating factor to make sure we get our systems in line. So are, are you, I, I want to make sure that I'm not misinterpreting what you're saying. So are you saying regardless of status that you would implement the suspension as opposed to the termination of Medicaid? Yes. And to be clear, right now, we don't have any process in place that is going in and 
terminating people when they're in a correctional facility. Um, if we get information that they are an inmate, then there's a process that terminates them that is automatically programmed. We're working to recode our system so that that doesn't happen in the future. Um, but yes, in the future, regardless of status, we are going to be working to enroll individuals in Medicaid, make sure that they have Medicaid when they leave the facility and be suspended, not terminated. So we have a couple questions, Ashley, and Jenny and then Topper. So Jenny. All right, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. This is a real terrific uh, update and greatly appreciate it. Um, I went back, I'm going back to the slide that you have on the key features of the reentry initiative, shows the service and the provider. And then as well, um, the, it, what you were talking about recently with administering the change and what we have and what we don't have. But my question is, um, so we have the contractor, but Medicaid will still have to administer this program. Uh, and the contractor may be take, uh, carrying out the medical care, but there will be some uh, investment in the administration. So do you have a, kind of a, a printout um, an analysis of what the administrative costs are versus what the contractor will receive for the patient in this case. So, so you've got a couple of different places where I can see administration. And just how is that gonna <clears throat> break out? Well, you've got a slide. Well, I, I think this slide is important. It doesn't answer your direct question, but I think it's important to understand how we are thinking about paying for this service or <laughs> set of services. Um, so right now we're paying general fund for all of these services. Um, it's going to De Department of Corrections is paying WellPath for services that include regular services throughout the duration of their sentence, as well as pre-release services. Um, WellPath is subcontracting with a pharmacy contractor to provide pharma pharmacy services. In future state, what we'll be doing is actually um, having DOC still do that whole process. So DOC is paying well path. And then, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here, I think. Oh, no. Okay, this is it. Um, DOC paying well path. But what's happening is that DIVA will actually be paying a separate PMPM just to the Department of Corrections for reentry services. So nothing about the well path contract is going to change, but we're going to develop a per inmate per month calculation that is what the cost of the pre-release reentry services are. We'll be paying that once an individual is released, a three month look back so that we know that it's an actual 90 days pre-release and then DOC will be basically crediting their general fund allocation and debiting their global commitment allocation based on that claim event. So right. interesting. Good. So the provider that the provider is not going to be billing Medicaid at all. It's just going to be a, a intra agents AHS financial transaction. That's sure. right. The DOC will still give that advance payment in the form of general fund to the provider, and then we'll be truing it up on the back end after an individual is released. And will that, oh, I'm sorry, Medicare. Chopper has a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Let me no, go. this is real, This is helpful. This is good. Um, I'm, I'm fine. So, so, so Topper? Topper? Yes. You're um, next. Yes. Uh, if an individual uh, is incarcerated and um, they have plenty of financial resources and they were not on Medicaid or Medicare before they went in, um, when they come out, uh, how long are they going to be eligible for Medicaid because they're not going to meet the financial eligibility? 
So I, what I think, let me see if I understand your question. If an individual is in the facility, they're not receiving an income. So they're income eligible for Medicaid. We put them on Medicaid. They're then released. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying an individual has plenty of financial resources uh, when they're or when they're incarcerated, and and now and we're talking about you know the reentry thing, and we're going to put those people who are they they are they they're still making money even though they're incarcerated. If they are not eligible for Medicaid, then they won't be eligible for this Medicaid reentry. It's only for Medicaid eligible individuals, regardless of their incarceration status. So if they're determined, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. within hey, hey, correction. Wait, 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 wait. You, the services that you're providing, making sure that uh, the, the prescriptions are all set and everything else, that's, a, that's the other services you're providing. You're going to provide that to that person, regardless of whether they're Medicare eligible, aren't you? DOC is going to provide that regardless of eligibility, but we won't be claiming it as a Medicaid expenditure unless they're Medicaid eligible. Okay. Thank you. Lisa, did you? Yes. Um, actually, well, um, since we know that a number, uh, a pretty high percentage of folks have substance use disorder um, in the correction system, will this per member per month um, payment include uh, an amount that includes um, funding for medication assisted treatment? Absolutely. Okay, thank That's you. That's a big, a big part of the cost for us. Right, okay, thank you. <laughs> it also does not include the case management component. So this PMPM here per inmate per month, PIPM, is just going to be for the reentry services minus case management. And that is because we're using the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative case managers that are AHS staff to provide that case management service. And so we're we're not claiming that through a kind of fee-for-service model. It's an administrative cost, and we'll be paying it that way. Thank you. I, oh, can I have one more follow-up? It just made me think one of uh, one of the issues um, has been in the past the difference in the medication that's used within the correctional facilities versus what is used outside of the correctional facility um, is is there discuss are there discussions happening about how that transition process is uh, I guess more smooth because it has resulted in overdose deaths of people who have been immediately released? We have had extensive conversations about um, matching our formularies, the corrections formulary with the Medicaid formulary. And <clears throat> we are in a place where, with the exception of the long acting injectable mat, um, everything else is matched exactly on our formularies um the long acting drug we've done a thorough analysis the long acting mat i believe it lasts for a month the injectable we've done a really thorough analysis of <clears throat> cost there and it is extremely cost prohibitive for us to have that long acting injectable in the correctional faci facility at this time um i can't remember the numbers off the top of my head but it's something like $40 a month for, or $40 for one and $1,000 for the other, just in terms of scope, like it's a huge differential. And even when we accounted for the administration costs, we couldn't get them close at all. Um, so I'm definitely not the person to speak to kind of the, the clinical piece of that, but I will say we, we've done extensive work to come as close together as we can on our formularies and feel like we're in a, in a really good place right now. Well, that's certainly um, much better news than you know what has happened previously. So thank you and thank Corrections for the work on doing that. Do you have any idea about how many people are using the long acting? You know, versus, like what percentage of uh, the folks 
are using long acting versus um, the other formularies? So the long acting is going to be post release, and it's the, it's Medicaid's preferred mat. Um, so we are trying to get people on the long acting injectables post release. Um, but I believe Isaac, my information's a month or two old at this point. I believe we're not doing the long acting injection at all in facilities at this time. Is that correct? That's correct. Other states that do offer that use opioid settlement funds. Okay. To file and stuff. Okay. It is about $1,300 per dose as opposed to the $40 per dose that Ashley mentioned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We lost our chair. Are there any we other questions? Here for one minute. Go ahead. Do you have a question? No, I don't know. I'm, I, I have no more questions. Do, does anyone else have a question about the 1115 waiver uh, for folks? Good. Oh, thank you for your work on that. That was great. Thanks for your interest. Yeah, Hopefully, no. we can come back uh, when it is off the ground and report on our progress. When do you, when do you project that to, to be, Ashley? We're aiming for January 2026. So we're still a ways away. Um, we are just now digging into our IT systems to make the necessary changes. We have to figure out a way to flag individuals in our system so that we know that they're Medicaid eligible, even in corrections, and we can claim these costs. Um, we have to figure out our payment methodology within our claim system. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us and are looking at a little more than a year from now. So, Asher, I think one thing that's going to be important is when the new session starts to have the respective committees do a little, get an update on all of this and start doing a little deeper dive for that. So we'll have you back, some of us here. That's a good yeah, one. and I mean, one of the things that I'm presuming that you'll also be doing is uh, tracking uh, the cost differential, the, the potential general fund savings that should be achieved by being able to claim federal receipts for these services. So that, thank you for raising that. I think I said, I said this at the, my original um, presentation, but you weren't there representative. So there is a re reinvestment requirement that says any general fund savings, we have to reinvest in this population. So we won't actually be, generating new savings for our budget at large, but we are really excited about having several million dollars a year to reinvest mm -hmm. in our correctional population and think about how we can spend that money in, in really positive ways going forward. I'm going to put a plug in for housing, just saying. <laughs> he doesn't do housing. <laughs> DOC should not be doing <laughs> putting a plug in for housing. DOC <laughs> should not be doing transitional housing. It should be our community partners. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. Mean, it's for that population. It doesn't say DOC has to do it. We right? have transitional housing all set to go. Yeah. And one of the one of the cool things about this waiver is we get capacity building funding for it as well. So as I'm sitting here telling you that we have all this work to do over the next year and a half, I know you know. IT is expensive, and we're actually able to claim that cost as a, re a reinvestment cost. Um, so that general fund savings that we will see, we're able to immediately put towards the cost of our IT changes of new VCCI staff for this population, data managers to really be monitoring this closely. So lucky for us, we don't have to come for, to you and ask for more money right now for this particular initiative because it's, it's all self-funded. That's good. That is really good news. There are at least two, three people here who are on appropriations committees. <laughs> so one reason I got up and walked away, and Ashley, I don't know if you want to stay with this or not, but last meeting we had scheduled Ben to give us a review of a piece of legislation that we put in place last year and came out of my committee as well as Senate Judiciary Committee about reentry and the transition of folks to continue receiving medical care and continue receiving their prescription medication when they reenter the community from the facility. 
And I think this is a good transition. We didn't get a chance to do it last at our last meeting. And I quickly spoke to Ben to see if he could come up real quick and do this for us because we still have some time between now and 2.30. And Ashley, you're willing to, you're more than welcome to stay on if you can in case there's any questions. We are gonna be talking about MAT. Be talking about trying to get folks hooked up to Medicaid on the outside and hooked up with their providers. So I don't know if you have time to just listen in. There may be questions for you, sure. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to allow Isaac to report back to me on that. Okay. okay. And I will, um, we'll talk to you all later. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. So Ben, we're picking up quickly here because you were going to give this presentation last week. last week. And I think it's really important for the committee to see what <laughs> has been in place through this past session's uh, legislation. And um, I think... Megan's in the process of posting the, my memo on this for the committee website now, so you'll have access to what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and I'll try not to take Ashley's um, departure personally uh, as, as I start this. But for the record, again, Ben Overgrowski from the Office of Legislative Council. So Act 159, which started out of H 876 last year, which was a committee bill from um, the House Corrections and Institutions Committee um, that made a bunch of changes to the corrections laws. But as far as prescription and opi opioid use treatment coverage, um, it really, for the first time, enumerated the procedures and process uh, to administer uh, people seeking reentry uh, of, of these services. So like I said, there really weren't any laws that specifically outlined that procedure and the quantity of prescription medication for offenders preparing for release into the community. Rather, it was contract-based. Vermont law mandated that DOC figure it out, essentially, with its, which is with its third-party medical contractor um, to establish those procedures. Um, so what Act 159 did is put some guardrails in place to ensure that there's some uniformity. Um, so for instance, uh, there are really two parts to this, um, one for general prescription coverage and another for uh, what's previously known as medicated assisted treatment, which is now known as opioid use treatment disorder, or yes, um, opioid use disorder treatment. Medication Yeah, thanks, Isaac. Um, so the, it's a, the constant evolution of these acronyms. So that puts in the statute, but taking the, the first part of just general prescription coverage, um, it created the following mandates for DOC and its provider as part of the reentry plan for an offender taking prescription medication. One, offenders prescribed medication while incarcerated must be provided with a minimum 28 day supply of medication upon release, if available, and if it's clinically appropriate. Um, two, offenders are provided with a valid prescription to continue the medication after any previously supplied uh, supply has been depleted. Um, so basically you get one pills. Right, you get one prescription to redeem in the community once the supply that you leave the facility with is gone. And then so I want to be clear, we're tracking what the current contract is with WellPath. Yes. For this. So when a person is released, they're going to walk out with not less than 28 days, days, days of the actual medication in their pocket. Not a prescription, but the actual medication. And think about what folks are on medication for. It's not aspirin. It's a lot of, could be insulin, could be anti-anxiety, could be Adderall, could be a variety of things. But they're physically going to have the medication. And then they will also have a prescription that will become a, they can fill after that 28-day supply. So kind of a bridge prescription, if you will. Um, and that 28-day supply was very, or that number was very intentional um, 
from when it got to the Senate, but the understanding of the committees is that WellPath has a 30 day supply mandate in the contract with DOC. So it was very purposeful to not exceed that amount. Um, so the third aspect of prescription drug coverage is that DOC and its medical or its provider must identify any necessary uh, licensed healthcare provider or substance use disorder treatment programs or both and schedule an intake appointment with the provider or program to help uh, ensure the continuation of treatment once they're in the community. Um, so that's, those are essentially the three mandates of prescription drug, drug coverage for those seeking reentry. Um, any other questions before I get into the opioid use uh, prescription coverage? So one thing we were trying to address is the issue of folks who are reentering and have no health insurance and only have a few days maybe of medication in their pocket and they have a prescription, but they don't have a primary care provider. They may not have a drugstore that they go to and they have no way to pay for the prescription. So that's what we're trying to address. Okay. Um, so moving on to opioid use disorder and the coverage for, for that, um, again, three parts. One, offenders prescribed opioid use disorder medication while they're incarcerated must be provided with a legally permissible supply of the medication upon release if available and clinically appropriate. There's no mandated quantity in that one. It's really whatever is at the discretion of the, the, the doctor or the prescriber. Um, so that's why it's legally permissible. What is legal for them to have based on the prescription that's written? Um, the second part is that DOC must inform the offender and offer care coordination to help expedite the process to receive uh, counseling or, or behavioral therapies within the community. So again, sort of helping to set up a bridge so that they can access uh, those, those therapies and, and services as soon as possible upon release. Um, and then thirdly, uh, DOC or its provider must identify, again, similar to the prescription coverage, licensed um, health care providers or opioid use disorder treatment program or both, and schedule an intake appointment to help ensure that continued treatment. Uh, so those are the three aspects for opioid use disorder and the slight differences from uh, the pres general prescription coverage. <clears throat> so as this was being structured, was there any discussion about linking the offender once the offender goes out into the community linking the offender with our hub and spoke uh program yes okay <clears throat> and yes so because when a person this is what well path and the contract says if a person i'm going to just say mat that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. so if they're on mat what well path by the contract if they're on MAT, they come out, they would give them enough dosage to hold them over before they could hook in with a hub or hook in with a provider. So it could be three days supply, it could be five days supply, whenever they can hook in with that hub. But we wanted to make sure that we've got DOC working with the offender to expedite that and to get it set up. Senator Lyons, is your question a little bit? No, else? my question is different. Or are they um, the mention of hooking directly up with the hub so that when they get back out to the community, they're working with um, medical providers familiar with <laughs> use of Yeah, there's nothing specific in the legislation no. about it. And I, I couldn't <laughs> be misrepresented. I don't recall that there was a specific conversation. Okay. about that it's really general so it, the way it's written it could include the hub and spoke as well. right it uh, says opioid use disorder treatment program but the medical doc or, or its medical provider right must identify um the opioid use disorder treatment program mm -hmm. so it would help the offender know where to go it may not be a hub maybe something else the recovery center right right but it, it's something 
So they're not walking out with 28 days worth of MAT. 28 doses without having some. They're not even, MAT. they're only walking out with the number of doses they need before they can hook up with a opioid use disorder treatment program. And, and there was, the, the language is very, was, was intentional in the sense that it was to inform and offer care coordination, not to necessarily mandate it because that would infringe. Right, um, patient rights. Patient. It, it, exactly. So the obligation on DOC is just, <clears throat> is just that, to offer, to inform and offer, and then it's up to the individual to pursue it if they want. Thank you. But by doing that kind of addresses what some of the questions when Ashley was here about folks transitioning to the community and the continuity of care. So the goal is with the Medicaid waiver, the 115, if the offender can get hooked up three months prior to their release date for Medicaid, and then with this change in law that we've done and with <laughs> Medicaid being available to them, Upon release, it's it's more of a um, continuity of care. We don't have the interrupt like we do now, because people coming out, they don't have insurance. They've lost everything when they've been incarcerated, and some of them don't even know how to apply for Medicaid when they're out, which means they can't get the health care that they need. So that's how the change in the law that we did hopefully we'll work hand in glove with the Medicaid waiver down the road. I think I said, on, on that point, Chair, it is actually, we didn't intend to really craft the legislation to match the federal requirements as part of the 115 waiver process, but they're remarkably similar mm -hmm. um, in that the federal requirements require a 30-day supply of medication in hand upon release, as Ashley mentioned, requires care coordination. Which DCC, I think that was probably going to be one of the biggest aspects of the 115 program, one of the biggest benefits we'll see is that we'll have embedded DCCI staff at every facility who are helping to transition folks as they leave um, our facilities. I think that will make a tremendous impact for incarcerated folks. Um, but it's interesting to see the kind of mirroring between federal requirements and, and what H876 put in place. So, Topper, you have a question? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and it's along the lines of the statements that you were making. One, one thing I want to get clarified, because some, sometimes I'm having trouble hearing what's said. Um, if an individual is coming out, uh, they're coming out of being incarcerated, and these these benefits that we're talking about that they'll have, um, I, I heard, I thought I heard somebody say appointments will be made, uh, things like that for them. Um, and um, they'll, they'll see these people as soon as they as possible. What does that mean? Uh, are we talking to somebody, could, could somebody have to wait two or three months to see a doctor or to see, to, uh, to get into a program? Uh, because to me, if that's the case, we're not doing what we, the intent was was to bridge it so that that wouldn't happen and they don't get tangled up with the people they've been, they were hanging around with before they went into prison. Well, well the legislation, the way- what I'm saying? I, I do represent McFawn. And the way that the legislation is drafted is that, you know, the, the duty is to schedule that intake appointment um, or, or, but, like I think many of us experience when we're scheduling doctor's appointments, that can take, that can be quite a while. So the, the assistance is really in the coordination of it all, but no one's really skipping the line, so to speak. They're, they're just kind of getting in the back of the line if uh, with the help of DOC. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So the, 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 there's no protocol or, or no procedure that says, okay, we know this person, is going to be out in six months. We know that it's very difficult to get a doctor's appointment or, or, or other kinds of appointments. They don't, I mean, is there no time when they, they start early enough so that a person doesn't have to wait when they get out? 
you know, for an extended period of time because I, I see I see everything breaking down if they have to wait a long time. Yeah, I, I, I see your point. I mean, that might be a better question for DOC itself as far as how they, when they start this process. But my understanding is that it's typically 90 days prior to release that this all starts to get into motion. So I think that's the time frame. Maybe there are exceptions, but. Yeah, I mean, part of it also depends. We just talked about earn time, which, you know, that release date can sometimes be a moving target. So if someone has a major DR, you know, their release date might get pushed back seven days. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit difficult. But that is one reason why we also narrowed the population sentence, or as we talked about in committee last session, the offender. That's why that like, term is used in Act 159, because the CTE population can be so difficult to estimate that release date. Yeah, and that is something that's that's good to highlight. In the statutes, there's a difference between an inmate and an offender. An inmate can be everybody. An offender is a sentenced individual. And this is just limited to offenders because, as was discussed in committee at the time, there are, I think, you know, what I would phrase as practical impediments to providing such services to people that may only be there for three months total or two months or six weeks or a weekend. Um, you know, so there's sort of that practical element involved. And the other thing too, Topper, we may think in the best of world start knowing where a person's going to go six months prior to their release. The key to finding a provider is where is the person going to end up living? And sometimes those decisions aren't made until a couple of weeks before their release in some situations. Um, and that will determine uh, what is available in that particular area for a primary provider or a treatment program? And if it's that. not available, um, then what do we do? Well, that's that's the question because things don't transition in in DLC's world. It's it it's different for every mm -hmm. offender because every offender has different life situations. Um, and, and that's the reality that we're trying to work in to make it as seamless as possible. But, um, there's so many variables in terms of where that person's going to go. Um, the inmate or the offender may think they can live in a certain place, but that's not reality. And, um, that all has to get worked through and transportation. And transportation is an issue. Um, family members may not want the person to come back to that family, and the offender may say, oh, yeah, my family will take me, and that may not be the reality. So the D DOC is working within that, and once that gets settled, which may not be for a couple of weeks before their actual release date, then you've got to really scramble to get those support services in place for the person in that particular community. Yeah. And you can see an element in this legislation that kind of accounts for that, those variables. I mean, there was, a, and the I think in House Corrections, there was a lot of desire from the committee members to really prescribe that they're always going to have this X amount of, of prescription drugs. But you'll see that there's language in here that says, if it's available and if it's clinically appropriate, because if you're mandating DOC always supplies someone with a 28 day supply upon release, but for whatever reason, the, the, the pharmacy doesn't have that much, then there's a mandate that they can't fulfill. So this gives, this accounts for such a variable. And so to uh, the chair's point, it's, it's hard to uniformly account for so many different situations given on the uniqueness of each individual. And many of these individuals do not even have a primary provider. They may not even have a primary provider when they come in the first time to be incarcerated, or they haven't seen primary provider in 10 years. So you're starting from scratch. And I was just not, right. not to add fuel to the fire here, but uh, um, a number of these folks is, have ended up in the hotel program. Um, through emergency housing and um, it, it's uh, probably more likely than not that they won't have that available to them because that it will be full given the limitations that 
are in place right now. So that's a, another variable that uh, enters into this equation. Really simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I wanted to give the committee an update in terms of we are, we did do some work to try to address having a seamless transition into back into the community in terms of the medical piece. Um, but there's a lot of barriers there that offenders encounter. They don't have a primary care provider. They, a lot of folks coming into an incarcerated situation to begin with don't even have insurance. They may not even be on Medicaid when they first go in there. So we're really starting from scratch. And they, they don't have much of an ID when they come out. We <clears throat> try to address that in this piece of legislation, which you can't get anywhere, can't pick up medication. You can't even apply for Medicaid unless you have some form of an ID. Yeah, and that wasn't a portion of this that I, I agreed to this memo, but you know, a portion of Act 159 was, was exactly that, um, getting DM, the DMV to, to, to memorialize the statute, the agreement already in place between DMV and DOC to give people seeking release non-driver identification cards so that they can at least redeem these prescriptions. And then to also provide them information on other forms of ID that are available if they want to get a driver's license or whatever, but that would be on them at that point. But what will be provided um, by DOC are those non-driver identification cards um, if, if requested. I mean, ironically, some of the testimony we received said, well, sometimes the person just needs to say for an ID. Some of the folks don't even know where they were born. So when we start hearing testimony like that, things that we just take for granted um, doesn't always play out in the corrections world. So I just wanted to put this on the table to follow up from the 115 waiver. And it hopefully we'll come together and be seamless. We hope for that. So we do have a little bit more time before VSCA is coming in. And I know uh, we need to talk a little bit about this morning with the earn time. We didn't have any committee discussion on this. Um, what are folks thinking in terms of recommendations? <laughs> yeah, they're going to need to write something here. I know I was hearing the um, victim notification system, maybe making some recommendations on that. Do we recommend? Um, we can spend more time at our next meeting in November on this too, uh, but we want to make a recommendation. Mary Jane Ainsworth is suggesting that to have it equal and fair to recommend on time for folks who are on parole, the victims, uh, victims are totally opposed to that. Um, the other piece, do we try to flesh out trying to do earn time for folks who are in a work program or educational program. Those are really the three, three pieces that I see at this point. You said victim notification. Victim notification. Uh, Topper, you have your hand up. Is that a legacy hand? Yeah. Is that Is it? No, no, no. I, uh, I, 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 I particularly want to make sure that, the, as you said, Madam Chair, there is a very specific procedure um, to notify victims of any movement uh, of the person, whether they're coming out of uh, being incarcerated, whether they're moving <clears throat> from one place to the other, if they're on parole, uh, as they move around. I, I, I just really feel that they ha someone has to be responsible for notifying the victim and, and um, there has to be a a specific procedure to do that because um when i listen to what's going on uh in the victim's life uh to me uh we 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 really need to listen to that and do something about it that makes that makes sense <clears throat> 
Um, yeah, I mean, I wrote down some things about about that victim notification as well. I mean, it, like, for instance, I don't know, did they talk about it at the police academy? You know, so uh, is that it, it seems as though what we heard loud and clear this morning is that multiple touch points. So whatever the touch point that the victim is encountering, whether it's law enforcement first, whether it's, you know, um, crime victim services, whether it's the um, victim services at the state's attorney's office, um, whether it's the judiciary, um, that that there needs to be uh, a consistent <clears throat> message about the notification system. And then it seems as though that there's there's some ongoing work between the state's attorney's office and, and DOC about uh, improvements to the system. Um, so, I mean, and I guess um, I'm not a big supporter of expanding access, expanding a program that I think has got some things that need to be worked on before we expand it, I yeah. guess. Yeah, <clears throat> earn, earn time, whether it's earned or learned <laughs> the, the I, I feel like there's work needs to be done on the current program <laughs> before we can expand it. That's my So what work needs sense. to be done on the current program? Well, I mean, victim notification is a big yeah. one, is a big aspect of it. Yeah. Um, I think um, I didn't realize, for instance, and I, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about it, but I didn't realize um, that there really are no crimes that are disqualifying. Um, and so I, I feel like I want to think about that a little bit. Um, I didn't realize that was a sort of a, a one-time change. Um, uh, so that's that's one, you know, the, the role of uh, victim assistance um, and state's attorney, through, through state's attorneys um, and whether that's an appropriate, you know, what are the resources needed? I, I just, I guess I'm not uh, sort of bent on trying to expand something when we can see that there are places that there needs to be improvement. Um, so, and, you know, we also heard from DOC that uh, while they picked it up, um, what we put in place right now, that they would need additional resources to implement it any further. So, um, I, I'm not sure that that's where I want to put resources as a investment right now. And, uh, just to clarify that point about what disqualifying yeah. how that went. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I clarified in the memo that was posted, so mm -hmm. it's revised now. But so what it was is those disqualifying offenses. So as you say, Representative Wood, after the effective date of the program, which I think was April 26th of 21, everybody can be eligible unless life without the sentence of life without, without parole. But between January 1st of 21 and that April 26th date, those disqualifying offenses, they could earn time if they were already serving a sentence for one of those offenses. Mm -hmm. Everybody prior to January 1st could not. So it was sort of like a gradual implementation, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so just to clarify that, that I think my memo, my testimony before may have muddied the waters a little bit on. So um, that four month period, those disqualifying offenses could get some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But going forward, anyone, anyone can. disqualifying offenses would qualify. Unless them. they're serving life without parole. Right. right. And the thinking there is that upon a plea agreement or whatever, that the victims <clears throat> would know that earn time would apply. Where previously, when we changed midstream that we implemented earn time, the victims didn't realize that in sentence. So well, and, and the, where they have access to that information, like to me, if if um, states attorneys, crime victims advocates say that their role is only during the court process, then it seems as though they would have been the appropriate folks to say, well, this is what was agreed to. You know, this is what was the potential, and this is what was agreed to. That, and it seems as though. Uh, you know, it's at least lost. it's getting lost in that. In yeah, that. It, it's done it. The plea agreement. It's done right, it. it's done. It's yeah. not DOC's It's role. not DOC's role. Right, right. So, I agree. Well, the sentence here is 10 years minimum, but the person qualifies for earn time. So this is the potential they stay. Right. Yeah. That's in Martin's world. So I, I think uh, um, 
Teresa summarized my feelings as well on this, but I would like to hear from Jennifer Pullman still. Yeah, we got to hear from Jen. And she's probably available now if we want to bring her back on Zoom, or do you want to put her in? I want to put her, I want to do that more in November when we can. So yeah, so we can focus a little bit more on what we're going to do with yeah. respect to victims. Uh, and, and it's broader than just the earned and <clears throat> time, although I agree that we need to get this uh, in order before expanding the program, but there's broader issues, I think, that we kind of just barely touched on a little bit uh, earlier, so. Other thoughts on providing earned time to parolees? By well, I'm, learned I time. agree that we shouldn't expand it till we see the program. <laughs> we can do more effectively with the program as a whole. But there's a real difference in who's making the decisions, unless you have some very concrete criteria for decision making. <clears throat> the whole board and the DOC are doing exactly the same thing. I think hold off on that. We heard from the parole board they were probably happy with our holding off on that anyway. So, <clears throat> and I, the concept of uh, <clears throat> listening to Jennifer Pullman and finding out what we can do. Mm -hmm. Effectively for victims is a good thing. Well, Does it belong in the judiciary or initially? How, how frequently uh, are they notified once things start to get in place? There's a lot of questions there. And looking at the structure of the bond or whatever it's called, man's minds. Uh, Topper? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I, I am not in favor. Uh, well, I'm I'm okay if 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 the earn time got expanded, but I think before we do that, we need to make sure that what we're doing now with these people, especially the victim, um, that everybody understands it and are all on the same page. From the testimony that I've heard, um, they're not at this point, and we need. To, I think that's very important for us to. Uh, prior to rise, make sure we're doing what we're doing now, we're doing it right. Because uh, I, I I, just, when I hear what's going on, it, it really disturbs me. I, I can't understand how a woman can be raped twice when we're supposed to have a system in place that protects her. I, I just, it's terrible as far as I'm concerned. Well, that gets into your restraining orders and that gets into all of that in the court system. Yeah. That's that's what that brings up more than victim notification in a way. So it's wow. interconnected. It's interconnected. It's interconnected. So do you have enough, Ben, to kind of put together a brief uh, outline of what we're recommending so we can go over it next month? Yeah. And we'll we'll schedule in Jennifer and do a little deeper dive great. on that. Great. So, yeah. uh, a quick question, clarification. <clears throat> My first concern is victim, obviously in the full procedure. As far as the uh, the earn time for individuals who are incarcerated, I'm not really sure where I am on that right now. But is it my understanding that the buying notification system automatically does this for individuals? They don't have the option on this because we took testimony that she said every they time that the they call, yeah, they, they, have, they have the option. Yeah. they have the option. Well, That's once they sort of opt in, then it can become automated. Okay. Back in the day, we'd hand out a physical paper, three copies, and say, "Do you want to be? We want to express sort of blah blah blah." And no long story short, they they signed that they wanted to be notified. I just want to make sure that these victims are cared for. They want to be notified. Is it is it an opt in or? I was like, we can. I think maybe for November, we can bring in our subject matter experts, our victim services unit, talk about that and that system. And and as far as what I can speak to is just based on like the statutes and what I've researched, which is. They're informed of it, and then they can have access. I, I can't speak to what that access look like, looks like beyond that, but there is an automated feature to the system, but it's not automatically automated, if you will. Does that make sense, Senator Norris? I know what you're trying to say. Well, also, we <laughs> did in the laws. <laughs> no. We made sure that it was offered, but we didn't want to mandate <clears throat> that every month or every three months, the DOC notifies the victim of how much earned time the person has earned. 
we're leaving the victim to make that decision because the testimony we received from the victim <clears throat> um, folks was that for some folks, it's a re-traumatizing <clears throat> of the event. They don't want to be notified or they want to be notified less often because it's so traumatic. So we leave it up to the victim themselves to make that decision how often they want to be notified. Some want to be notified a lot and some don't want anything to do with it. Okay. So just to kind of summarize, what I'm hearing is that it seems like the committee wants to hold off on expanding to learned time um, and then potentially ref well, refine the Vine system and refine the current earn time program. What about expanding the current earn time program to parolees and holding off on that as well? So basically take care of the current structure before any expansion is considered. What I'm hearing. Is that a good foundation for the long run story there? Okay. <laughs> well, it's always about housing. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you. You're going to be back up a little later. Oh, yeah. Close the thought. Yes. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. So last um, last meeting we had, we heard some issues around the staffing of correctional facilities. Uh, we heard about the new staffing hours that the OC has implemented. We heard from some correctional officers, um, yes and no, and stresses of what's happening within our facilities. Um, BSEA has requested to come back in with some uh, folks to really talk about facility staffing. Um, I want to be very, very clear. We're not getting into contract negotiating issue to uh, negotiating between VSCA and, and management. That's up to the union. That's up to those folks. The collective bargaining situation where it's not a legislative role to get in the middle of that. But we do need to hear how staffing is impacting our facilities uh, and, and impacting our state employees who are working in those facilities. And see if we can come out at the end of this Maybe all sides coming out. I kind of voiced this to Vince Aluzzi saying it's time for people to come to the table and start really working on this with new ideas. And maybe if both sides, be it the union side and be it the executive side, go in their own corners and brainstorm and <clears throat> figure out different ways of approaching this issue. And one thing that struck me, and I mentioned it to Vince after our meeting when he connected with me, uh, one of the officers was talking last meeting about looking at different incentives. And one thing that was mentioned is if you're really working all those overtime hours, can those overtime hours get calculated towards your retirement? You know, those are the kinds of thoughts that we now need to bring to the table because we've been hearing for a number of years, we need more money we need more people. We know that, and we know we can. We we know we can recruit at times, but the key is is uh, retention. That's the key, and maybe it's time to really start brainstorming about what can we do here to incentivize folks to really stay there when they're brand new. Because it's starting to happen in some of our correctional facilities because of. Retirements that are happening and the level of veterans and the years of service that people are having in some of our facilities, the longest serving correctional officers been there maybe three years or five years at the most. So we're going to be dealing with some real security issues at some point and we've really got to start tackling this one way or the other. So that's my soapbox for today. Um, Steve, are you coming up first and then bringing some folks with you, or what's? Uh, I can. I can. Be. I, uh, Serena Zahn is a CO2 in Newport. Okay. Um, How do you want to? It's up to you, Madam Chair, whichever you prefer. I mean, I'm okay. happy to go first. Yeah. What are the Want to come up with me? Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, for the record, I'm Steve Howard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Employees Association, and we represent the frontline staff um, in our correctional system. We also represent Serena Zahn, who is a, a veteran, a 16-year veteran of, uh, of corrections, CO2 uh, from Newport, who can uh, talk with you uh, directly about her experience uh, as a frontline worker in corrections. Um, I wanted to share with you, and I think we have, I hope we have <clears throat> this, we try to do a better job of that. Um, just a little bit of uh, research that the SEA did put together um, to outline some of the circumstances that our members are facing. And really, I just, I think, Madam Chair, you, you already said that you, you, you do know what, what is happening. And I can't uh, stress enough to you uh, how our members feel about what is really a public safety crisis. Uh, we are at some very dangerous levels of staffing. It just came from a uh, a labor management meeting at the Springfield facility just yesterday. Uh, I think there's a universal understanding of the crisis that we're facing. Uh, and you can see that some of the research that since June of this year, uh, staffing vacancies have increased from 15% to 18%. Uh, we are forcing correctional officers to work 16 hour shift after 16 hour shift after 16 hour shift driving home exhausted, often falling asleep on their way home, away from their families and away from their lives. Um, that is also true of um, some of the folks in the probation and parole uh, offices across our state, particularly in the southern part of the state, um, where we have seen a, uh, a real a disproportionate amount of hospital coverage in the southern end of the state, 65.3% of the hospital co coverage is in the southern part of the state. Um, some real sentiments of our, of our members uh, come through in the sustainability uh, and the, st the stability and st uh, sustainability survey. Um, our members really having expressed that they feel abandoned in a crisis. Um, and when the majority of DOC staff were asked um, uh, how they feel the DOC leadership, whether the DOC leadership cares about them or they receive adequate communication from leadership, you can see the numbers are pretty overwhelming that they don't think the leadership cares about them or that they receive adequate information. Um, it's really a serious impact on them personally. Uh, you can see from that same study that their work schedules negatively impact their sleep, their mental health, their self-care, their physical health, uh, the time that they have to live their life to have, from hobbies to errands to their relationships with their families and their friends. And I think what our members want to ask from the legislature and from the administration, first of all, we think uh, very clearly that there needs to be transparency. We have TV ads running ad nauseum, you may have seen them, uh, where we say, well, we change the schedule and we have work-life balance and come work for us. What happens is that people do come work for them and then there is no work-life balance. 16 after 16 after 16 and what they say is this was not what I was promised. And so they say, I feel lied to when they leave. So we gotta first stop saying that we have work-life balance until we do. And I wanna just wanna make it clear that the SEA is not against the 223 schedule that the commissioner is talking about in these TV ads or these talked about before this committee. We know that schedule will not work unless you have a recruitment and retention plan, which involves a recruitment and retention incentive. We know that works, it has worked. and We have to have that brought back to the table. The legislature can help in a couple of ways. One, you can improve the pension. The BSEA is very proud that we led the campaign and successfully convinced the legislature to finally pass a new pension plan, a retirement plan, plan with, with, in, when we put Group G in place. What we did not do is give them the same 
uh, retirement plan that the Vermont, the Vermont State Police have, which is what we originally wanted and what we originally asked for and what we would hoped that in this legislative session, the legislature would, would consider. That is a significantly lower contribution rate, and it also allows them to retire um, at, at age 50 after 20 years of service. Group G is age 55 after 20 years of service. So there is a way to improve, that the legislature, not involved in collective bargaining, can make improvements to the statutes around retirement. We also need you to use your leverage and your positions as public leaders to speak out and to call on the governor to come forward with a plan. We really need your help. We need you to stand with our members and to say this is an unacceptable situation and we need you to come to the table with a plan and really work with the union because we're happy to work with the administration. We have done it time and time and time again. Um, we need a plan that's put in place and left in place. Put the point to pull back on a plan is it when it's starting to work, which is what we has been the historical record. Uh, we need to keep that plan in place. It's going to cost the state of Vermont more money to staff the correctional facilities. This is really difficult work. I think you all know that. We're in a very difficult labor market. That's not an excuse to, to do nothing. That's an excuse to, to ramp up your game and to come to the table with even more. So with that, I, I would um, like to just turn this over to the real expert and have uh, her share with the committee what her experience is um, now and over the last 16 years of her career. Welcome, Sabrina, if you could identify yourself. <laughs> My name is Serena Zahn. Um, I'm a CO2 at Northern State. Um, first of all, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a grandmother. Um, I participate in my community. And then my job as a corrections officer. I wanted to say that um, when Commissioner Demo spoke last month, he showed us a lot of charts and graphs. And we were referred to as numbers and statistics and data points. And it felt really dehumanizing because I think he's missing the point. We've heard a lot of people's experience that were tired. Um, I wanna say it goes beyond tired. We're not just a little sleepy. Um, it's bone weary, exhaustion, tired. When we're working a 16 hour shift, the first, one of the first things that is outlined in our post orders is that you must remain alert. Um, I work overnight, so, and I don't think I've ever really adjusted to overnights. Um, it's very difficult to stay on your game when you're living on four hours of sleep night after night. Um, to compound, you know, the short staff were being ordered. So most days that you work in 16 hours. And then on our day off, days off, sorry, we have a standby list where you sit there and wait for your phone. I refer to it as being on house arrest because we're stuck by the phone waiting like Russian roulette, whether you're going to get the phone call or not um, to have to go in. Um, night shift, that poses a little bit of a problem because do you catch up on the things you need to catch up on? Do you take a nap? How do you schedule your time? Um, it's used to be a balancing act and there's no way to balance it. Um, our superintendent has has tried to alleviate some of the pains of that fallen by making it every other pay period, which helps, but it's not enough. Um, what was I gonna say? So if you think, when you have a 16 hour shift, on top of a 16 hour shift, they have to give you an eight hour turnaround. I live 45 minutes from the facility I work at. So I leave at five o'clock PM every day to be at work for um, six o'clock. And that gives me a little time I can stop and get a coffee if I have a quick errand I can do. Um, but it also means that my time home is, amounts to about six hours. And if you think about your own lives and all the things that you have to do outside of your working life, 
how you would prioritize your days given six hours. Um, I tend to try to priority, prioritize sleep, a shower. I probably eat home maybe once a week. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult. <clears throat> you think of family obligations, just tending to your house or your yard, um, going to church. Um, whatever things that you do in your life that's not work related. So our lives, at least my life, I can speak on my life, has revolved around work and trying to get enough sleep to go to work. Um, I can definitely think of right now. That's fine, that's fine. So we've been, <clears throat> I'm really looking for thinking out of the box here on both sides because we keep, we've been hearing this for, two years, three years, four years, nothing's, nothing is changing and it's really time to start changing. And I know folks have said, let's put more money into it. Let's do another side letter, but we still come back to the same thing. So I'm gonna put out a challenge there. I'm putting it out to the folks who are working the boots on the ground, state employees, and I'll put it out to the administration, DOC. Go back and think of initiatives that could be put in place that would help. Don't just think of money, think of initiatives. You know, I was really intrigued by this. If someone's really working a lot of overtime hours, working overtime, can that be credited towards their retirement? There's other options. Could former employees come back in and make any time to start alleviating this? Could case supervisors come up to the table and start helping to fill in? Could our field officers, PNP officers come in on a Sunday? I Ma'am, all of that is happening. Our case, our case workers fill in overtime. We have probation and parole that come in and do overtime. Um, I think everybody's doing their spot to try to fill those holes. But there's but that may, is that happening across the system, or is that just I can only like, speak to our facility. But maybe this is something that needs to be implemented across the system. Maybe it's still only happening in a facility here or a facility there. Because we can't continue going on with the same conversations because the same situation is just getting exacerbated. And I'm really concerned about, I'm concerned about the safety of the staff. I'm concerned about the residents that live there and the safety. And I'm concerned about the security of the facility. Because I don't want an episode to be start to happen because we don't have enough staff. We've got to start thinking outside the box. So I'm putting out a challenge to you folks and to the administration, DOC, and come back in a couple of months with your recommendations. And I don't know if the committee would be supportive of something like this, but I've been hearing this. Sort of Can I have, do we have, I know you just put down, do we have any charge in any of the legislation that asks us to make recommendations? If we don't, even if we don't have that, we can make recommendations to our committees of jurisdiction. But I think this is a really great idea. I think it's a good idea. Because we gotta start, we gotta start getting on the dime here. Because it's not the legislature that's gonna get involved in negotiating between VSEA and the governor's office. We're gonna have to start thinking out of the box to really address this. The two, two, three can work if there's enough staff. There isn't enough staff. So how can we? Well, another idea that came to me from someone saying, instead of just having one academy, could we have academy satellite academies around to start you know, bringing more people in for training? Can we make those first two months of a new correctional officer in the facility, make it so that they're not slammed with 16 hour days or make it so that, hey, this is a good place to work and maybe I'll, stick it out for another five or six months and see what happens. Because I think we're getting to a critical point now in terms of our facilities, security of folks within that facility and with the facilities. And we've got to start thinking out of the box. So do you work on something then? Because I talked to Matt about this a little bit in terms of putting out a time frame out there and he quickly just drafted a letter or drafted a piece of item that, you know, we've got 
two more meetings. So mm -hmm. two more meetings we got, maybe by our December meeting or our last meeting, each each end comes back with your recommends. I want some movement on this, and I don't want to keep hearing the same stuff. Because I, I came across some notes five years ago. I was cleaning out some of my paperwork at home, and I came across some of the notes, and the same thing that's being said now was said back. And I don't I want to move on and make it better. I, I agree with you, Madam Chair, in terms of, you know, getting off sort of square one. I guess I, I think it's, uh, it's a bigger issue. I, I, I mean, I fully appreciate the DOC issue, um, but it's a bigger issue in state government. Uh, and, you know, the sort of, I guess I would say the, the creativity things that you're talking about and getting off square one is things that we need to be, uh, I guess, figuring out as a body, how do we do that um, you know, broader than DOC, you know, I know I brought this up last time, but uh, I, I actually look at these numbers and I think, well, <clears throat> that's good compared to DCF. Mm -hmm. um, and that's good compared to some of the others. And I know that that's an improvement from where it was, um, which is what the commissioner would tell us. Um, that doesn't mean it's good enough. Uh, uh, but I guess I, you know, I'm looking at VSEA and VSEA represents all state employees. And if, if we were having um, you know, a discussion about uh, caseworkers at DCF and the, you know, lack of resources available to them. They're doing these same kinds of shifts in in similar uh, similar working conditions that actually might be more dangerous, to be honest with you, because <laughs> folks are not in, in cells. So, and and I'm hearing this in other departments. You know, uh, people not being able to respond because they have vacancies, and I, I don't. Uh, I'm a little perplexed because I'm not really sure what our role is because there's a collective bargaining agreement, and uh, you know, it has different elements. And I'm not. I uh, so I'm looking for some guidance on that. I guess I, I'm going to agree with you. I think it is extremely frustrating, and I can remember several conversations in my committee talking about what's optimal caseload. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how many how many folks do you give for each social worker or counselor uh, or supervisor? And uh, it, it goes on and on. And you're absolutely right. Um, so we were here from crime victim advocates this morning. The mm -hmm. is hundred, which is really probably more like a thousand. You know, but we have an opportunity here, I think, to do exactly what the chair has said, and that is to think of some creative solutions where we are now, and maybe some of that leads to uh, what's how do we optimize what what's needed at each of the centers? And it might help focus in terms of we, uh, what we needs... have the money to cover. <clears throat> I think the process. Well, it could help focus what would be needed to go forward with a collective bargaining. What would be needed to change some statutes? What would be needed for funding? I mean, right now, it's a big glob and there's no movement. So let's do some. I don't want to ask a question here. Thank you. I appreciate what you all do. I really do. I've worked in corrections in another galaxy far, far away a long time ago. Okay. And I know there's a shortage of personnel. I understand that. In most cases, there is throughout the state of Vermont. But my question to you is every time that we listen to Mr. Howard songs, it feels like we're getting in between places we shouldn't be, between administration and the SEA and whatever else. It's putting, it's putting some additional pressure on us. But you talk about being on call, you talk about them calling you in. Who's calling them? Sick. And other union members who know that what you're going through and you're still leaving you after it. I mean, you got to police yourselves. I think that's the Well, it could be. It could be somebody called out sick. It could be just there's an empty spot. There's plenty of vacancies that we just don't have people to fill. So they could be calling in sick knowing that you're all working 16 hours a day. Yeah, sometimes. You think that's happening? Sick. I'm sure. It, oh, Let me I'm give you sure a Some of that does happen. When you can't get rest um, in your schedule, it's wearing. And sometimes the only way you can get a break is to take a sick day. 
And I don't think anybody's doing it maliciously to hurt your, your coworkers, but enough is enough, you know? Let me give you a situation what's happening down in our Springfield facility. We have about 350 residents there, but only a tax staff. I have about 44 to 50 staff. And they should have 88 to 100. That is serious. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care which facility it is, and I'm not bringing it up because it's Springfield, and that's where I'm from. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And I was in there last week for a meeting, and you could pick up a real difference just walking into the library, the, library, the lobby, and working through to get to the meeting room in the back. There was nobody around. And I've never experienced it there. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. So that. Yeah. Why don't you do what you had drafted up? Oops, I'm sorry. Topper, you have your hand up. Then I'll get to you then. Topper? Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I, on television, I, I saw um, not too long ago a, a concerted effort, I thought, um, uh, by probably the corrections department to hire people um, in the system. Now, I don't know how many people got hired through that that concerted effort, but uh, I'm just wondering what the emphasis is, is on in terms of the recruiting uh, that's being done and who's doing it. Um, I, 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 I mean, everyone knows that the solution to this is more people working there. Um, I, I just don't know, and maybe... Uh, Mr. Howard can tell me who who is doing the recruiting for you, uh, to to uh, the, or the corrections department rather can tell me who's doing the recruiting and 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 how extensive is it? Well, I won't speak for the department, but what I can tell you is um, what our members tell us. So first of all, the best recruiter for the Department of Corrections is somebody who works for the Department of Corrections. If they, are satis if they are satisfied with the way in which they're being treated, if they are satisfied with the way in which they're being compensated, they will go to their neighbor, to their relative, to their friend and say, come work for corrections. When I started this job 12 years ago, the problem in corrections is we had too many people. And that's because there was a big, there was a big effort to bring people in with our members reaching out to their, to their families and their friends and their networks. What our members tell us now is that they wouldn't do that to their worst enemy because you'll destroy their family, you'll destroy their marriage, marriage, and you'll destroy their health. So that's the first thing. We have to fix the underlying problem. And Madam Chair, I think the SEA is more than willing to continue to bring solutions to the table. We just had a very um, effective labor management meeting with the commissioner, which our members wanted to make sure he understood what was really happening in the facilities, because we're not always sure and also offer solutions. But the number one thing they said, which goes to, to Representative McFawn's question, is you've got to stop telling people we have a work-life balance. When they get there and it doesn't exist, they leave because they feel like they were deceived. So let's, let's, get, let's admit that that is not working at the moment, even if we want it to work. And we do want it to work. We want 223 to work. Let's acknowledge the problem, which is a challenge, and, and uh, then we can get to the solution. But I, what I would respectfully suggest the legislature can do, you, can, you can't get involved in collective bargaining, we wouldn't want you to. But you can bring pressure on the governor to, to, to direct his staff to come up with a solution. He's done it before. So let's go to the letter. Let's Go to the letter because it's it's directed to Commissioner Demo and it's directed to the SCA. You're both in this together. We're not getting in the middle of this. So for the record, my name is Gross from the Office of Legislative Council. And, and that last point, Madam Chair, that, that you just brought up as the legislators are my client, I advise the legislators that the collective bargaining issues between the department and the PSCA are just that. They are not the purview of this, of this committee or nor the legislature. That being said, there are things within the jurisdiction of this committee and, and the legislature that it can. So it's sort of with that 
broader sense in mind that this that uh, Representative Emmons asked me to pen this letter. So, uh, dear Commissioner Demel and Executive Director Howard, given your testimonies from our recent meetings, the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee requests that you collaborate on creating solutions to the current staffing issues facing the Department of Corrections and its employees represented by the Vermont State Employees Association. The committee respectfully requests that you both present the proposed solutions at our December 2024 meeting. Without these requested solutions, the committee will be forced to make policy decisions that may be unsatisfactory to the department, the SCA, or both. Such decisions may include increasing the state's reliance on out-of-state correctional facilities for its incarcerated population and the closure of state correctional facilities or units within the state facilities, among other potential options. Please let the committee know if you have any questions or concerns. So that is a rough draft. I don't want to force it down the this committee to agree to or not agree to, but let's see if we can work through on something. And I want to hear what people's thoughts are because the SEA can brainstorm some thoughts, go in your corner and brainstorm the administration, corrections, go in your corner, brainstorm. And you know what? There may be some similar proposals that come out of it. We got to do something here, folks. So I don't know where the committee is. We're very happy to participate in that process and, and to continue to bring ideas to the table. We know what works and we hope that we can. And it's not going to be putting more money at it. That's that has, what we that has historically worked. So we keep oh. hearing. <laughs> yeah. well, I was just going to say, and, and uh, I recall testimony saying I, I, it's several million more dollars that, yeah, that we're, that we are going to be in, we already getting a request to do in budget adjustment. They said they're coming to budget adjustment with a request for, I don't remember the exact number. So I'm just not sure that we can go continue to go beyond that and whether it can be used more creatively or, you know, what solutions and, you know, you, you had mentioned Steve, a few things last time, you know, to look at that weren't necessarily money right <clears throat> now, but did involve things like giving credit for, uh, you know, like we were talking for retirement and um, what to do with, I, I know right now, unused sick time. People tend to use their, their sick time in certain types of positions. And, you know, are there ways to incentivize people to not do that? And, that gets so. a little bit into collective bargaining. It, it does, which is not, not something that we're going to necessarily yes. suggest. But if you two come to the yeah. table and suggest that you're the parties to the collective bargaining agreement. So... Um, and I mean, I, I would love it if they would work together and present something that they both agree with, not necessarily go off to your separate corners and then come back together, but. We're happy to try. Yeah. Would we, how about DOC? Do you be able to do something? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe you start out with separate corners and come back, come together before you meet with us. I think we've already started mm -hmm. some of that. I don't care about your continuing excited. What does the committee feel? Good idea. Oh, we should do this no, letter. Yeah. Well, well can, I'm not ready to say do this letter. Maybe we could just look at it between now and November, November. come back, and if there's some edits we want to make. Well, I think we, if you want to get this out so I that they to, have time. To clean out. So I'm, I have to say, I'm not that, that the second part, yeah. you know, sort of threatening what solutions might be, I think yeah. is a little, yeah, not. Yep, and that's what I'm on that point is because those issues are within the purview of, of the legislature. Of the legislature. You, know, you can choose to, I mean, it's just the way it's worded. Sort of capital budget, you choose to not run facilities. Yeah. So, I mean, if we want to edit that a little bit, instead of saying we'll be forced, I would say may make policy decisions that may be unsatisfactory. That tamps it down a little bit. Have the alternative of making policy. No, I think that's what me. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I don't know why we're getting involved with this, especially the last line in the first paragraph. Yes. Yeah. Are we the judge and meet? Well, what's if going on here? if we don't do a date, certain we'll never get a recommend. But they're presenting the proposal solutions that they're. To us, for what reason? But to see if we have to do anything in paragraph two, I think is the idea. And make recommendations to our standing committees. 
because we can do that and it's joint justice. Right. We don't enact policies, but we can make recommendations. That's always been the role of the joint justice committee for a number of years. A topper, do you have your hand up? Yes, Madam Chair. I, I think that um, uh, the, the addition of uh, maybe the Department of Labor or if there's a state personnel um, division that's responsible for recruiting for different agencies, I, I think they would be, um, it would be uh, good to have them involved as well. How does that work? Isn't it DOC that you work directly with recruiting? You don't work through Department of Labor, do you? Well, human <laughs> resources. Human resources. Labor allegedly, at least when I worked there, um, recruited um, for everybody. That would be human the employers, resources. Employers, but but also state uh, agencies, and there was a personnel department. I don't know what they have now, but uh, they, they would recruit for you too. So here we have a state agency that needs uh, okay. someone to, to really do a top notch job for them. I'm, I'm just saying, why not include people that do that for a living? I mean, that's their, that's their job. <clears throat> When DOC does recruiting, do you work through HR? Do you go directly? Do you have your own? You have your own. System. Our own but we also do work with DHR. So maybe one of the recommendations that comes back from this going out and making recommendations could be that there could be more coordination between the SCA and DOC and human resources for setting up a structure for recruiting. Maybe that could be one of the recommendations. I think if you start bringing in more people in this, you're going to dilute everything and it's going to take longer. That's my concern. But maybe that could be a recommendation to have you involve HR with the other parties, maybe the CA. I don't want to lose that thought, Topper. So what what change did you put in there, Ben? Many, many. Uh I just changed that first sentence, paragraph two. Um, without these requested solutions, the committee may recommend the standing committee's jurisdiction to consider policy decisions that may be unsatisfactory to the department of the SCA. Then you have those conditions. Leave that, change it. That's that second. What is the committee thinking? Second sentence, I have a problem. Do you have a problem with the second sentence? You can take that out. Yeah, yeah. that don't need it. Yeah. 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 I'm sure I have one suggestion if you're open to hearing. Uh -huh. So I, I do, some of these may not, I see, I see them in that second paragraph. You also have the jurisdiction over pensions and retirement. And I, that could also be a recommendation that may or may not be something that um, I would include that as enhancements to retirement as a possibility. I just wouldn't put anything in the no. second sentence. Let's you folks figure that out. Yeah, that's, that's come back that. Let's you folks figure that out. So take out that second sentence. And then we're left with giving the charge of what you can do, make, you know, it's collaborative on creating solutions, but you each go off in your own world, brainstorm, and then figure out how it's going to work together, and then present it to us at our December meeting. And if there are no solutions, then we're going to make recommendations to standing committees to consider policies. <clears throat> Basically what it says. Yeah. Does that make sense yeah. to folks? Yeah. I like the letter. Do yeah. we want a date for the like paper in there? <laughs> well, we it's, want a date our December, it's our December meeting. Right. Do we have a date certain yet? Because I think that should I'm be not, in there. I yeah, I don't think we have a date yet for December. Do we? Okay. Um, according to Doodle, 
Doodle. <laughs> doodle, doodle. November 21st would work for everyone except Senator Baruch and Senator Lyons in the question mark. Bond was a maybe. And December was December 17th without Senator Baruch. Senator And you're going to put that up by evening, right? <laughs> yeah. Or has I gone out already and I missed it? I didn't send it out yet because we didn't. Okay, send it out. So, well, that's why I didn't specify. Right. So, November, <laughs> November 21st is our next meeting. And then yeah. the December. What day of the week is that? December is that Thursday. Oh, see that? It could be Elkar. That's all. And is that then. Well, that would be a problem for you too, Trevor. And then December 17th is a Tuesday. Perfect. Tuesday is a good. Brian didn't think they were good for you. <laughs> Just try to make you look. Well, better. put in December 17th. <clears throat> Let's hope and it November doesn't. November 21st? Well, we don't need November because they're going to be working. But November 21st, I think Trevor's looking to see if it's Elkar. I think it is, yeah. Is yeah, it Elkar? That's why I said I had a question. Yeah. Is it all day or is that a half day? No, no, it's morning. It's ten to noon. Ten to noon. He's the chair. He can tell you everything about it. Ten to noon. There's two of us gone. Two of you gone. Mm -hmm. Oh, depending and on what your agenda is, maybe yeah. it's an afternoon meeting. <laughs> oh, brother. Well, for the purposes of this, it seems like the 17th works. Yeah, that works. December yeah. 17th, that works. So we can sign off on that letter, and I can sign it on behalf of the committee mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's go for it. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Serena. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, what are we going to do for November, folks? Well, can we, can we make it 11th? I'm for me. Sour, something that Jimmy doesn't care about. And Trevor. And Trevor, of course. We care about it all. Well, you're at the competitive table, so I prefer you. 11 to 4 works. What day is that on? Friday. No. No, it's a Thursday. Thursday. You're gonna work on a Friday. No, on uh, Thursday. You can still okay. go hunting on Friday. Let's see. I'm I know. You can still go hunting. I'll, I'll be booming in from my beard line in Michigan. That's okay. I'll make it. November 11 to 4. 21st? 11 to 4. See, I don't know what we have for rules. If we only have a couple of rules, we could get people. Yeah, we may not have that. Done by right? that. Yes, we yeah. could. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. But I when will you know? Like two weeks in advance? Yeah. Well, okay, so, so we should just put a hold on it anyways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Say we're meeting that day and we won't figure out the time yet. Okay. Perfect. It could be 10 to 3 or 11 to 4. Perfect. Copper and Irene, a hold on November 17th. Well, that's my fear too. That's... November seventeenth is a Sunday. You mean the twenty first? Sorry, I meant yeah. I didn't mean. Uh, Thank you. That's okay. November November twenty first. Yes. And then December seventeenth. Yeah. Thanks. We adjourned because we can go. I think we're adjourned. We're, we're adjourned. adjourned. We're adjourned. We can go up live.